A few months back, I asked you guys what anime you want to see me roast the most this year, and the most enthusiastic response, by far, was for Netflix's flagship shonen franchise, The Seven Deadly Sins. A series I personally haven't touched at all since binging the first season way back in like 2014, 2015 with my buds, but I do remember having a pretty good time with it at the time, so maybe this will be the one roast I don't have to suffer for. Let's go find out, shall we? Many unbearable hours later. Same kind of immortality as bonds? Not at all. We're dealing with a being who transcends life and death itself. This is a tale of ancient times. An era before the intro and rest of the roast were forever divided. Jeff, Yazzie, and editor Trey were nearly through wasting the better part of a week on the seven deadly sins, when suddenly they found themselves unable to stay awake through the endless slurry of special attack names and meaningless platitudes about hope and friendship and love and junk. But just when it seemed like all hope was lost and the roast would never be completed, back Backup arrived in the mail. Gamer Sup's energy drink, delicious, potent, and keto-friendly, was just the thing these valiant warriors needed to soldier through their ordeal. And because they'd used the promo code BASEMENT for 10% off, they had more than enough to make it through the end boss gauntlet. Thus, the Demon King was at long last defeated. Then, he was defeated again. Then, he was defeated again. Then, the secret bonus boss was defeated. Then, after the fake-out ending, he was really defeated, and our heroes heroically watched it all. Moved to tears, or maybe it was just the boredom, Jeff vowed that he would dedicate this ad spot to their savior, though he and Trey still had much work ahead of them. Now, before I get into saying mean stuff about it, I do want to give The Seven Deadly Sins credit where credit's due for accomplishing something almost unprecedented. Anyone can make a bad anime, but it takes a lot of work and quite a bit of skill, just shy of enough, to make one this consistently, sustainably disappointing. Disappointment requires expectations and emotional investment. You gotta make people People want to see what happens next before you can give them the old Tokyo Ghoul. And after that first big rug pull, it's unlikely that an anime will catch them off guard again if they're still watching at all. And yet, by carefully pacing out its letdowns and ensuring that none of them are too great individually, Seven Deadly Sins is able to get you over and over and over again until the cumulative disappointments add up to more than you ever thought thought you could feel toward anything that's not a shitty family member. If watching The Promised Neverland never get a second season was like falling off a cliff, then this anime is more akin to tumbling down an escalator for two days straight. Then, right when someone finally has the decency to shut it off and you think your ordeal is over, you land in a pool of your own blood tears and piss, and then they spin it up again for a couple more hours just to make you roll in it. Don't worry though, they censored all those unsightly liquids by coloring them white. Okay, but that's worse. I mean, you, you, you do get how that's worse, right? The process starts subtly, as the series kicks off with a premise so genuinely intriguing that many kept watching even after seeing Protag Kun shake his love interest's boob before shaking her hand. Also, she was unconscious. Long ago, the kingdom of Leonis was shaken to its core, when the Seven Deadly Sins, its most powerful group of magic-wielding holy knights, supposedly murdered their own Grand Master in an attempted coup. Ten years Later, Meliodas, the Sin's leader, is hiding from the law in plain sight as a barkeep when the royal princess herself, Elizabeth, crashes into his traveling tavern begging for help. For it turns out Hendrickson and Dreyfus, the new grandmasters and true masterminds of the coup, have imprisoned the rest of her family in a bid for power, and now the exiled Knight Order is the kingdom's last hope for salvation. So the pair set out in Meliodas's magic traveling tavern to gather the other sins and fight back against injustices wrought by the arrogant and power-mad Holy Knight Order along the way. But doubts still hang in the air, for from the unhinged undead thief Bon, to the temperamental and violent giant Deanne, to the impulsive fairy warrior King, who keeps creeping on Deanne's giant tits, to the cold, emotionless Gother, the sins are all kinda sketchy 
sketchy dudes. And they did get their squad name for crimes they apparently committed even before that one big murder, which Meliodas also can't remember at all for some reason. So the question hangs over Elizabeth. Can these anti-heroes really be trusted? Yes, absolutely. Also, they're not really anti-heroes, and all of them were either framed or their crimes were greatly exaggerated. The show lets that cat out of the bag pretty darn quick and drops the whole subversive dark fantasy pretense by, like, episode 9 in favor of a more thoroughly generic shonen adventure formula with a bit of extra edge. Think fairy tale with a lot more blood and a touch of cartoon Satanism. Also, the artist can draw more than three faces. That's the first big letdown of the seven deadly sins. But the animation of the generic shonen action stuff is still pretty darn tight, and the show is in the middle of introducing a sizable cast of heroes with differently interesting powers, from reflecting magic at double strength, to a wolverine-type healing factor, to transforming weapons, to earth-bending and mind control, so it feels easy enough to take that disappointment in stride in anticipation of all the beautiful and creative action that's sure to come. But then they, uh mostly just keep using the same special attacks the same way in every fight, and Meliodas gets a Ninetales Naruto knockoff demon berserker mode in lieu of finding any actually creative applications for full counter. Also, the series starts reusing villains and their abilities by, like, episode 12, but they got powered up with demon blood, so it's totally not a foregone conclusion that the heroes will whoop their asses the exact same way they did the first time. Oh wait, no, yes it is. Now, an attempt is made to add some wrinkles to this with a secondary power system of sacred treasures, mystical artifacts that complement the inherent magic of each sin. But half of those basically just buff the range and or power of their respective sin's existing abilities. Another one is basically a debuff that limits collateral damage from the strongest sin, Escanor. King's treasure is just his ability. Bon doesn't get his treasure, until the second to last battle, at which point he's already lost his healing factor and is just a generic punching dude with Kazuma Konosuba's steel ability, and Merlin's magic orb is just never explained. Like, at all. The only treasure with an even remotely interesting power synergy is Meliodas's sword, which lets him make these half-power shadow clones of himself that can use his full counter ability to counter stuff harder, or theoretically from a bunch of different angles at once, which seems like a cool idea, but then either the mangaka forgot that he had that right after it was introduced, or he got a cease and desist letter from Masashi Kishimoto because Meliodas uses his clones so little that in the final battle, having them play Ganondorf tennis with a magic energy ball to make it more powerful is somehow a new idea that the series hasn't done before. Not even the addition of the Stand-esque Ten Commandments, curses that inflict busted status effects like petrify or charm on anyone who breaks their rules in front of the demons who carry them, including the demons themselves, helps much with all that repetition. We get one semi-cool moment where the Demon of Truth turns himself to stone by bitching out of a fight he promised to see through with Escanor, who would have just pasted him anyway with his ability to have the biggestest power level whenever it's high noon. So that doesn't really make that much difference to the outcome of the fight. There is the one time that Meliodas's huge attack is stopped by his younger brother Estorosa's commandment, which turns off all other attacks if you're angry when you use them, but they don't actually explain how that works until the second time Estorosa shows up, which just happens to be right around 11.30, so Escanor is way too much stronger than him to be mad and instantly kicks his ass. It seems like the commandment of pacifism which drains the life of anyone who tries to murder someone in front of it might do something around the same time, but then Merlin shows up and she's just like, oh yeah, well, my power's infinite life plus infinite magic, so neener, neener, neener. And that's basically all the times those powers come into play after the concept's introduced. There, there's a couple instances where a few more of them get used on background characters to like very slightly raise the stakes, but almost 
almost half the commandments don't even have that much impact on the plot. Mons Pete's curse may as well just be that he and Derriere are stuck in will they won't they land forever. You heard that right. The constantly naked girl villain is literally named Ass. Though at least the mangaka figured out what all ten commandments would do, unlike the oft-cited seven laws of the seven deadly sins, of which only five exist, and two of those are just different ways of saying teamwork makes the dream work. With absolutely zero tactical nuance left in any of the characters' movesets. Basically every battle in this entire series boils down to both sides trading and tanking hits until the guy with the lowest power level loses. And they give the annoying talking pig comic relief thing a scouter in season two, just so it has something to do. So you know who's the strongest guy at the start of basically every fight. The whole point of scouters in the original Dragon Ball was that relying on them too much made the Frieza Force worse at fighting. So anytime you see a shonen writer start using scores to justify which character wins, you can bet they're running short on both ideas and self-awareness. Almost every combat use of magic in Seven Deadly Sins may as well be a beam clash for all the difference it makes in terms of strategy and drama. That said, it would make quite a bit of difference to the art and animation, and that much at least remains consistently gorgeous even as the anime's brains start falling out its ears, so it's easy enough to just shut your brain off and enjoy your ride on the hype train. Well, until we roll into Season 3 Station, they trade out Toon Boom for PowerPoint, and everyone starts bleeding c that is the most likely point that someone who's not watching this anime for a YouTube video will jump ship, but around that same time, Seven Deadly Sins does wisely decide to start solving some of its long-standing mysteries, so many viewers will probably stick around a few more episodes just to find out that the answers to those were the most obvious thing that they guessed the second those questions were posed. However, the lengthy flashbacks that deliver those unsatisfying answers also set up some imminent character development. So you may as well stick around just a couple more episodes to watch half the cast change their entire personalities and motivations at random. But by that point, the series is already like two thirds of the way over anyway, so you figure you may as well just keep going to make good on your sunk time cost and see how it ends no matter how bad that ending may be. Which you'd think would mean that your expectations had finally hit rock bottom, but what you failed to anticipate is that the story could get to its logical end point like halfway through the episodes you have left and then simply not end for like 10 straight hours. And then, when it finally does, surprise, that's not the actual ending, mother we gotta fight another boss monster who popped out of nowhere and has nothing to do with anything! Seven Deadly Sins is a remarkably devious trap of an anime, many times more brutal than even Rent-A-Girlfriend's endless treadmill of fake progress. I I'm honestly kinda mad at you guys for pulling me back into it after I escaped by a lucky fluke that first time. Though I, I suppose I should explain how that happened, since it really highlights how not not good the writing here is. See, back when Seven Deadly Sins first dropped on Netflix, I assumed that the final nine episode arc, which marks a massive shift in both tone and story structure from everything that's come before it, was an FMAO3 style anime filler ending. Or more accurately, a Blue Exorcist season one style ending, since Tensai Okamura also directed that train wreck for A1 Pictures. I mean, come on, the Capital Infiltration arc kicks off with a teleporting wizard lady we've never seen before appearing out of nowhere to kidnap Elizabeth and ends with Hendrickson, the Machiavellian mastermind behind the coup, chugging demon blood to turn into a big dumb JRPG end boss for no apparent reason. Also, in the middle of the arc, a villain who introduced himself by cutting off an entire town's water supply because one child annoyed him reveals that he was secretly a good guy all along and the teleporting wizard 
lizard lady was really blackmailing him to work with the bad guys in hopes he'd fuck her one day. Also, there's the bit where Bond tries to kill Meliodas in the middle of all of that happening just because a disembodied voice in a horn told him that would bring his dead girlfriend back to life somehow. I honestly thought it was the most blatantly thrown together anime original ending I'd ever seen. So I didn't really want to jump back into the new seasons when they were greenlit, especially not after Blue Exorcist's mediocre 2018 pseudo reboot. And that's how I was two weeks ago years old when I realized that no, the Seven Deadly Sins manga really was written like that. And as I moved into season two, it quickly became clear that it would keep being written like that when Hendrickson's co-conspirator Dreyfus revealed that not only was he still alive after dramatically sacrificing himself to narrowly stop the resurrection of the demons last season, but actually he was a demon all along who was the true mastermind behind the plan that he was just instrumental in stopping. Now, that's not to say the anime adaptation didn't change anything. There were a few adjustments made to the season one finale to make it feel more conclusive, which necessitated a four episode mini season of actual filler to fill in the gaps between that and the start of season two, which with such thrilling episode plots as the gang chases a pig around the city for no reason and Bon and Meliodas fight to the death again for no reason, brilliantly sets a low enough bar that the Dreyfus reveal almost seems like it makes sense after you get through it. That bar reaches its lowest point in the episode where Deanne recovers the memories that King had previously erased of him being her adopted older brother figure several hundred years ago, back when she was the giant equivalent of a kindergartner, which immediately causes her to confess her love to him. But then he immediately gets hit on the head with a rock and forgets all that happened, so she feels way too awkward to confess again through most of the next season until suddenly she gets magic amnesia out of nowhere and runs away from home. To be clear, that last part's not filler. That is actually how the manga tries to keep their will-they-won't-they they thing going longer. Also, Nakaba Suzuki wrote those filler episodes himself, so apparently he thought highly specific memory loss was a good enough plot point to use three times in the same romantic subplot. Perhaps I treated you too harshly. The really crazy part about Deanne and King's triple amnesia thing is that somehow it's not a shoe-in for the worst romantic writing in this anime, because every last ship in the Seven Deadly Sins is seemingly in a race to see who can sink the furthest fastest. You've heard of 3,000 year old lollies. Well, the Seven Deadly Sins subverts that trope with a 3,000 year old Shoda. Demon Prince Meliodas may have the body and face of a child, but he possesses the mind and muscles of an adult man, which in a clever inversion of how anime's oldest excuse is supposed to work, only makes the way the show sexualizes him infinitely worse. When Son Goku felt up an unconscious teenage girl in the early chapters of Dragon Ball, that was an expression of naive, misguided curiosity from a kid who'd literally never seen a woman before. When Meliodas does it, it's just assault. And he does it a f***ing lot. Like, his favorite default gag is pretending to be depressed and jamming his face in that teenager's crotch. For some idea of how bad this is, imagine if Mineta was the protagonist of My Hero Academia, and instead of constantly shitting on him for being an awful little horn goblin, responses to his behavior mostly ranged from lying there and taking it to actively encouraging him. Now, a lot of this is supposed to be excused by the fact that Meliodas's main squeeze, by which I mean the girl he squeezes the most, Elizabeth, is in fact just the latest reincarnation of a goddess who used to be his wife. Cursed to get final destinationed within three days every time she recovers her memories of that past life, while he is cursed to watch. Which the anime also uses as a convenient excuse for why Meliodas never just f***ing explains anything to anyone, even though if he shared even a fraction of his knowledge from the last 3,000 years, most of the problems in the show could have been solved in like five minutes. Anyway, the whole cycle of reincarnation thing is kind of romantic if you look at it from a certain angle, but from most other angles, it means that Meliodas has been assaulting and grooming the same girl Girl, whom he's known in this iteration since she was literally less than a day old, over and over for the last 
last 3,000 years. Keep your hands off my woman, understand me? But I swear, Your Honor, she consented in a past life. Now, you might be tempted to respond to that with a yikes, perhaps even all the yikes, but trust me, you want to hold on to at least a few of your yikes for the rest of these. Now, to be fair to Bon, when he tears the clothes off a teenager without her consent, it's by accident because he thought she was a boy and wanted to steal them so he could wear them. Also, she actually gets mad about it, like a normal human would, and vows revenge. So she goes to get a demon blood power-up, like you do, comes back in a new set of armor with a boob window and thigh gap, declares, Now that I'm strong, I don't need to hide my feminine side. Thanks for making me a woman. And then uses his blood as lipstick. Eventually, though, the demon blood power-up does backfire on her when Hendrickson goes demon mode himself, causing her and everyone else who got a power-up to turn into a big stupid mouth monster. In order to stop her from doing a rampage and whatnot, Bond has to strip Jericho naked again. But this time, because he saved her life by doing it, instead of angry, that makes her horny. So she starts following him around like a lovesick puppy on his quest to revive his thousand-year-old lolly GF Elaine, hoping that he'll eventually give up and throw her a pity bang. Unfortunately for her, they live in a two-bit Dragon Ball knockoff where death is hilariously cheap. So a few days into their quest, one of the recently revived Ten Commandments casts a spell over the whole kingdom to bring every plot-relevant dead guy back as a rage zombie, including Elaine, who changes into a more evil, s**ty dress, then alternates between making out with Bon and trying to murder him and his hussy. Then, after they get away from that demon, who was narrowly stopped from eating Bon's soul by his adopted fox dad, who died three seconds after telling them his sad backstory the previous episode, who does a community grifter swap with his disembodied soul, Elaine stops being so angry. However, that means Elaine is fated to die again any day now because her body runs on anger now. But then she just doesn't, even though everyone keeps saying she's gonna die like any second for the next 50 episodes or so until Bond finally comes back from purgatory, long story, with the ability to magically give people attributes instead of stealing them from them, which he uses to imbue her with his fountain of youth immortality. So Elaine is back for good, Bond marries her, and Jericho finally gives up on him and settles for trying to f*** their son. Holy where the hell have you been, Loka, Batman? That's a whole lot of anime nonsense. And it only gets worse when you remember that, like her brother King, Elaine could shapeshift into an adult at any moment, yet chooses not to. Possibly because, like many fairies across all sorts of fiction, she and King are stuck in a perpetually childlike state of mind, which I guess would make his relationship with Deanne a lot less fucked up, but then uh, that removes Bond's excuse for everything he does altogether. It's a real Schrodinger's pedophile type paradox that makes crowning a true winner of this race to the bottom shockingly difficult. Or it would if Gother wasn't here. Gother was was originally a living doll, created to serve as a proxy for one of the original Ten Commandments, also named Gother, who was stuck in demon jail for many years because of reasons. After Daddy Gother sacrificed his life to end the big holy war with the dumbest plot twist ever, Doll Gother became a real boy with his own thoughts and also feelings in the form of a magic metal heart that his dad gave him in hopes that he'd live a fulfilling life. Then he got stuck in a well for thousands of years. Eventually, he was found by a princess with a real bad cough, which I'm sure is nothing to worry about. Then they fell in love, but she died right after the first time they ever boned because it was something to worry about. Whoopsie. So, long story short, Gother ripped her chest open to replace her broken heart with his metal one, but that didn't work because it turns out it was just a placebo heart, and his real feelings were inside him all along, where he promptly erased them along with all his memories to ease his pain. Now, so far, this probably doesn't sound all that bad. You might even read it as tragic, but that's because it's just the excuse. For you see, after losing his emotions, Gother became obsessed with trying to understand the human heart and acquire one of his own, which he mostly tries to do by f***ing with his friends, like that time he gave Deanne magic amnesia. But all of that pales in comparison to what he does to Gila, the squinty girl with explosion magic who f*** 
Hopkin killed herself to follow them into the spirit world back when Holy Knights were actually badass. When all the other Holy Knights with demon blood power-ups are turning into big stupid mouth monsters, Gother manages to stop her transformation by altering her memories so she has a little more self-confidence and also thinks she's been in love with him her whole life. Then he moves into her house, starts calling her his girlfriend, and also erases her memory of her younger brother because he personally doesn't really need a little brother. And while it's not shown what they do in that house, a lot is, shall we say, implied. Wait, that's illegal. Only if she presses charges as opposed to, let me check my notes here, thanking him for slipping her a magic roofie and setting her little brother up to die alone in the streets because it helped her remember her dead dad slightly more accurately. No, really, that's how that's resolved, and his pals just brush it off along with every other horrible thing he does to them and loads of other people because you don't understand! He's literally neurodivergent and a 3,000 year old homunculus! Except when he cross-dresses. That's the only time they treat him like a freak for some reason. About the only romance in this series that's not gross, excruciatingly annoying, or both is Escanor's unrequited crush on Merlin. I mean, he writes some pretty excruciating poetry about it, but like, the actual contents of the subplot are decent and inoffensive. He admires her for her strength and wisdom, and for being the first person in years to treat him like a real human, but he also fully accepts that his feelings aren't reciprocated, despite the arrogant nature of his reverse weird frat boy persona that comes out during the day. Also, even though her true form is yet another 3,000-year-old lolly, Escanor likes her as a fully grown woman, which pretty much makes him best boy by default. So of course he has to die tragically, or at least, you know, in an attempt at tragedy. A pretty solid one, even. Literally burning through the last embers of his life to save his friends, with Merlin literally burning his memory into her flesh with a single lingering kiss. It's some downright poetic shit that might very well have brought a tear to my eye if all the cutaways to King sobbing in the middle of his girlfriend's gargantuan gazongas weren't constantly making me burst out laughing instead. There's a time and place for fan service, and Seven Deadly Sins seems to think it's when people are f***ing dying. Now, as for why he had to sacrifice himself and why his love remained unrequited, that's a whole other can of worms which we'll unpack when we get to the rest of the ending. But for now, I'd like to hop over to the one track that might still have saved this train wreck in spite of everything else. The real draw with any work of epic fantasy is its fantastical world, where chivalrous heroes sally forth into battle and adventure and whatnot. Ancient lands full of ancient legends, mystical treasures hidden in the mists of time, culturally distinct nation states with fraught political allegiances. A fantasy story that completely fails at character and plot can still pull people in with a properly immersive world. So what lands do we have to explore on the magical continent of Britannia? Well, first up you got the main kingdom, Leonis. Then there's the other kingdom. Camelot! 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 It's only a model. Shh. And after that, there is no after that. That's the entire political landscape of this anime. Two places with the exact same architecture, clothing, and food. Okay, okay, I I'm not being entirely fair. There are other places in this world that play less significant roles, like the kingdom that got wiped out 35 years ago, the kingdom that got wiped out 16 years ago, the kingdom that got wiped out 12 years ago by vampires and then was rebuilt by racists and collapsed again in the movie, and the kingdom that got wiped out a couple years ago. So, yeah, two places. But of course that's just the human settlements in present day. We still got all the other races and their unique cultures to consider, such as the fairies who all live in one big tree, the giants who all live on one big rock, the druids who all live in one big stonehenge, the demons who all live in one big hell, and the goddesses who all live on floating islands covered in crumbling, vaguely Romanesque ruins. Also vampires, werewolves, and mimics who are kind of just around places. Now your response to that might be, hey Jeff, you're being reductive, what about all the lore? To which my only response is, 
what lore? Fairies f with plants and animals. Giants f with rocks and war. Druids f with religion and healing. And the explanation of the magic system begins and ends with there's magic. That's it. That's all the lore. As for Britannia's greater history, I can sum that up in a minute flat. Long ago, there was a race of angels who used light magic and a race of demons who used dark magic. And they f***ing hated each other, kind of just because, so a big war happened. All the other races got sucked into it, mostly on the side of the angels, but there was a stalemate until the sub-boss demon tipped the scales by wanting to f*** an angel, so then the dumbest plot twist ever had to happen to tip them back the other way, and the gods were forced to sacrifice themselves to seal the demons away forever. But not before the boss demon could put a curse on Romeo demon and Juliet angel, so they had to exist forever in differently inconvenient ways. Then, pretty much nothing happened for 3,000 years until a demon started trying to bring all the other demons back, so at the behest of a king who can conveniently see the future, but even more conveniently not the specific part of the future where they'd be framed for murder, Romeo demon and his 3,000 year old lolly wizard pack form a special squad of seven elite knights with the exact skills needed to f*** up a demon king and his top dudes. Uh, there is slightly more to it than that, which I'll cover when we get to the secret bonus boss, but yeah, that's pretty much everything the show spends like a quarter of its runtime laboriously flashing back to. But hey, there's more to a world than just its key locations and history. Real world building is really all about all the places in between those places and the events between those events where real life takes place. And indeed, Meliodas and co visit a wide range of interesting and varied locales over the course of their quest, such as Starting Town, Beer Town, Town That's Next to a Prison Town, Town That's Next to the Spirit World Town, Pottery Town, Tournament Arc Town, Crime Town, and wait, that's it, we're all out of major towns already. Though there are also a few places the characters spend like a minute or two in on the way to those other places, plus a few that exist to get wiped out for plot reasons and or be near the cave that one of the characters is living in for a bit of their backstory, such as Town with Windmill, Town with Beach, Town with Prostitutes, and Town with Mine. But aside from Town with Cavemen, even though it's medieval days, they're all entirely interchangeable, as are most of the plot significant towns, for that matter. And that's true no matter how much distance, or indeed time, separates them, because Britannia's been stuck in the Dark Ages for over 3,000 years. And in case you were thinking, well, maybe the characters help to liven these places up at least, uh, yeah. No, the background character dialogue here is one step below your typical early 8-bit Dragon Quest clone in that there's no tutorial text for variety and literally all anyone ever has to say is a very basic statement about the current event. The side characters do start out vaguely promising in Beer Town, which has a prankster kid and annoyed populace and a stern but forgiving mother figure. That's like three whole distinct personalities right there. But by the time they reach town that's next to a prison town, we're down to two, old doctor man and his kidnapped daughter lady, and it's pretty much downhill from there. Before too long, they're basically copy-pasting characters like prankster kid who pretends he's friends with Meliodas, who gets cloned as a different kid who pretends he is Meliodas. Leotis. Shit's so dire in the recognizable supporting character department that when it's time to bring the goddess race back in human form, the only viable hosts available are these two random jobbers from the second tournament arc. And on that note, while this anime's crimes against fantasy writing are self-evidently severe, the things it does to shonen battle storytelling might be even worse. By all rights, it should be impossible to do a tournament arc wrong. Sure, it takes a lot of work and writing skill to make one really shine like the dark tournament or tune in exams, but even if you're absolutely phoning it in, all you gotta do is give your hero a reason they can't lose, create a couple rivals with almost as good reasons, throw in two to three jobbers to establish everyone's capabilities, and maybe make one of them a secret villain with ulterior motives if you're feeling spicy 
fantasy. Wham, bam, instant stakes and drama, just add special effects. How can you possibly f*** that up? Well, Seven Deadly Sins fumbles its first attempt right out of the gate by making more than half the participants on ladder the hero's teammates and everyone else jobbers, so after the first couple rounds, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that the good guys will get the prize that they entered the tournament for. And Bon has to bribe some hussies into triggering Deanne's Sundere jealousy just to inject some action into the last round. As for the second tournament, which is run by demons, the prize of granting any wish is obviously a trap from the word go, even without the baddies constantly gloating to each other about how they're totally gonna eat everyone's souls later. But it does create, or at least imply, some believable motivations for the competition to give their all against our heroes, so Theoretically, it should be the better tournament arc by default, except that Meliodas's only motivation to be there is, eh, seems like a fun way to kill time, and Deanne, who still has amnesia at that point, loses her motivation immediately when she realizes that her wish can just be granted with Elizabeth's healing abilities. So it somehow ends up having even less stakes. Due to these issues, both tournaments run out of steam by round two at best, forcing the heroes to start a random fight with some villains who appear out of nowhere before the audience gets bored. And it's almost impressive that's even a possibility, considering each of these is only a few episodes long. The second time around, I honestly started wondering if the author was like allergic to decent pacing and well-justified plot escalations. And then, as if to confirm my suspicions, the series used the second of those out-of-nowhere tournament derailing fights to kill off its protagonist. Of course Meliodas gets better, real quick too, like literally two episodes later, which makes it a wee bit silly that they changed the whole OP for him. Though there is a bit of a time skip there, and in that time, we get to see the whole kingdom go to shit, with villagers hunting holy knights down to appease their new demonic overlords. More specifically, we see that from the perspective of some prison guards who threatened a doctor with murdering his daughter if he didn't poison Meliodas, while planning to kill both of them after the deed was done anyway. We're supposed to sympathize with those guys. Now. And if that gives you narrative whiplash, wait till you see the recently resurrected Meliodas turn into a villain because he left his emotions behind in purgatory and then powered up too hard while fighting some skeletons and a giant snake. Well, I guess he was already doing a bunch of stuff that All Might would say only villains do, but after Elizabeth finally activates her final destination curse, he gets desperate and decides the best way to save her is to take the power of the Demon King for himself, which is really convenient for the demon because at the exact same time, most of the surviving Ten Commandments spontaneously decided they didn't want to be villains anymore. First, though, he's got to have a pointless, embarrassingly animated fight with Escanor. Then everyone else has to have an even more embarrassing and pointless multi-part fight with one of two old man demons who are even more powerful than the ten most powerful demons ever, but we've never heard of them until now because reasons. Then he leaves to become the bad guy. And all that that takes six episodes out of the 30 total, across which the series stretches the three-day time limit for Lizzie's curse. In a brilliant writing move that allows us and the audience to experience what Bon goes through as he scours purgatory alone for the captain's emotions to turn him good again. Being immortal, he's the only one who can survive the time dilation. As that's happening, Meliodas orders the remaining demons in Camelot to gather the Ten Commandments, the MacGuffin slash powers, not the guys, so he can absorb them all and become the Demon King. Then King Arthur tries to take the demons out with Excalibur, but he sucks and immediately gets yeeted by old man demon number two, so the human army must instead join forces with the top dogs of the goddess race, the Archangels, who are back now because Elizabeth's least interesting sister and a couple jobbers touched some statues. After a bit of padding, these three plot lines congeal into three absurdly bloated fight scenes that take over 10 episodes to resolve in total, most of which are spent on one 
one-liners and special attack names. In the first one, Merlin, Escanor, the boss archangel, and two jobber knights take on the old man demons and Meliodas' little brother Zeldris in front of the Demon King cocoon thing in an epic game of nuh -uh, my power negates your power. Meanwhile, Bon, Meliodas, and the annoying pig thing's long-lost brother from Purgatory spend several time-dilated centuries beating their heads against Meliodas' dad to reach the Purgatory emergency exit, eventually discovering that the Demon King's magic lets him reverse all magic that's used on him, meaning that all Bon has to do to beat him is give him life energy rather than steal it, which is the last decently clever fight idea this anime will ever have. There are still 16 episodes left. Meanwhile to that meanwhile, King, Deanne, Gother, Elizabeth, the other two archangels, and Ass in French, who here plays Android 18 at home, battle the other Meliodas brother, Esterosa, who wants to absorb all the commandments for himself and achieve his perfect form so he can bang Elizabeth, which swiftly devolves into a contest to see who can pull the most transformations and convenient new special moves out of their asses, that is, after the dumbest plot twist ever is revealed. Esterosa has long believed that he killed the most powerful archangel, Mael, who was the original source of Escanor's High Noon ability, but in reality, he was Mael all along, and the original Gother brainwashed him, along with everyone else on the planet, to think that he was the Demon King's son, which threw off all the power level ratios and forced the goddesses to sacrifice themselves and seal the demons to end the Holy War. A revelation that you'd think would end the fight immediately, since everyone's on the same side now, but Mael's kind of going crazy from the mix of good and evil energy inside him, so everyone's got to keep beating his ass for way too f***ing long. When that's finally over, his commandments fly off to Camelot to get absorbed into the cocoon, and the Demon King gets ready to hatch. Two episodes of stalling, fusion dances, and way too many special attack names later, he finally does. And surprise, even though Meliodas' emotions escaped purgatory, the OG Demon King has stolen his body. His soul is trapped in the spirit world, fighting for control of his body against the Demon King, even as the sins fight that body on the other side. But he can't see outside, so his dad tells him that his girlfriend, who he did everything to save, is already dead, making him give up hope, which is basically like dying in the spirit world. But then some of the sins and his girlfriend astral project into his brain and tell him she's not dead actually, so he gets his hope back and kicks his dad's ass to get his body back, which helps them kick his ass on the outside, and the day is saved. Using the power of the Demon King, Meliodas is at long last able to lift the curse. However, he's now too OP for the corporeal world to handle, so he and Elizabeth have to go live in hell. But right when they get to the portal, oh no! A big rock almost fell on her, and her curse has been reactivated! Turns out the Demon King's still kicking, only he's in Zeldris's body now. So the Sins gotta go fight him again. After a semi-quick detour to fight another demon, because Merlin accidentally left the door to hell open. Eventually, they all do arrive at the lake where the Demon King is, but even with all the sins there and Escanor burning through his life energy to keep his ultimate going past its time limit, they'll still need Zeldris's help to win. His soul is trapped in the spirit world, fighting the Demon King for control of his body, even as the sins fight that body on the outside. But he can't see outside, so his dad tricks him into thinking that his girlfriend, who he did every everything to save is already dead, making him give up hope, which is basically the same thing as dying in the spirit world. But then, some of the sins in his girlfriend astral project into his brain and tell him she's not dead, so he gets his hope back and- what's that? Editing mistake? No, silly, the Demon King just did all the same stuff twice. Well, okay, there is one small twist this time around, where Zeldris gets split up into a bunch of Zeldris clones to make it harder to save him, because if they hit the wrong clone, then they'll get kicked out by the mind's immune system. But then his girlfriend immediately finds the right one, and Meliodas is all like, how'd you do that? And she's all like, well, wouldn't you know if it was Elizabeth? And he's all like, yeah, I guess I would, except hold up! 
Hold it a f***ing second there. In one of the very first episodes, a bunch of mimics pretended to be Elizabeth, and Meliodas had to make her jump up and down to figure out that the real one was the one whose panties he stole. God damn it, I hate this anime so much! But thankfully, it's finally over. After the Demon King possesses a mountain, setting up the greatest one-liner in anime history, I blow away mountains for breakfast! And they kick his ass one last time with the... Ganondorf trick that I told you about several centuries ago. Then Meliodas obliterates the Ten Commandments for breakfast by conveniently using up the last of his power, which means he can stay in the human world, marry Elizabeth, become the king, and live happily ever after fighting the secret bonus boss. As it turns out, both the Demon King and the Supreme Deity were created by a primordial entity known only as Chaos. But many years ago, worried that the other races might worship Chaos more than them, they conspired to seal their creator inside the giant green pig thing that carries Meliodas's tavern around. And that seal is finally released after millennia, because back in the Holy War days, Merlin really wanted to bang Meliodas, but even after magicking herself up a Walmart Nico Robin body for him, he only ever had eyes and other body parts for Elizabeth. So she figured the next best way to fill that void was to resurrect the ancient Chaos God, and spent the next 3,000 millennia scheming to make that happen by pushing Meliodas to kill the Demon King, then turning King Arthur into the King of Chaos, which worked, giving Arthur the power to reshape the universe to his will, which he vowed to use to improve life for everyone. But then it turned out that his annoying talking cat comic relief Thing was actually an ancient chaos beast that wanted to eat him and steal his power. And also, it's even more immortal than the Demon King. So they gotta fight that for a while until Merlin freezes it in time. Then everyone goes their separate ways, Elizabeth grows old and dies, and the cat thing gets unfrozen and Meliodas has to fight it alone. But then actually that was a mindfuck illusion and they're still fighting it and Arthur uses his powers to turn space into a big mouth and eat it. Then then the anime is just sort of over. Everyone goes off and gets married and has kids and junk. It's heavily implied those kids will have their own adventures in a spin-off one day. And everything I just said got crammed into four episodes, aka one less episode than it took to rehash the Demon King fight. Now you're probably thinking that's a deeply unsatisfying note to end an anime on. Yup, I'm Jeff Thu, professional pain sponge, and I gotta go apologize to my editor. Please go buy some gamer subs.